This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. StoryBeat episodes are available at storybeat.net, YouTube, and on all major podcast apps and platforms. If you like this episode, please take a moment to leave us a rating or review. And won't you please subscribe to StoryBeat wherever you listen to podcasts. My guest today, music producer John Yap, is the founder of internationally renowned J Records, John has dedicated his life to preserving musicals for generations to come. Some of his masterworks include My Fair Lady, West Side Story, The King and I, South Pacific, Man of La Mancha, Annie Get Your Gun, Cabaret, and many others. John's latest recording, Anyone Can Whistle, was recently released 23 years after it was recorded. The CD features Julia McKenzie, Maria Friedman, and John Barrowman, plus the musical's book writer, Arthur Lawrence. The show's composer and lyricist, Stephen Sondheim, said, quote, the brilliance of this recording gives the show more energy and sparkle than it's ever had, closed quote. John started J Records in 1980 with a live recording of the review Nashville, New York, music by Kurt Vile and Vernon Duke, lyrics by Ogden Nash. In 40 years, John has produced thousands of recordings, including works by Leonard Bernstein, Lerner and Lowe, Candor and Ebb, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Cole Porter, Jerome Kern, Stephen Schwartz, and virtually all significant Broadway and West End writers and composers. He's also recorded many stars from the stage, opera, TV, and movies, including legends like Liza Minnelli, Judi Dench, Richard Harris, Cheetah Rivera, Cleo Lane, Anthony Newley, Betty Buckley, Sarah Brightman, David Hyde Pierce, Patti Lupone, John Hausman, Honor Blackman, Julia McGinnis, Elaine Page, Christian Borel, and Carol Channing, among many others. John has also recorded over 22 original cast albums with the York Theater, including Busker Alley with Jim Dale and Glenn Close. So for all those reasons, and many more, I'm truly thrilled to chat with the extraordinary producer of memorable musical theater recordings, John Yap, on today's Story Beat. John, welcome to the show. Hello, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm great, and thank you for joining me. So let's go back in time and tell us a bit of your history. You have been a musical lover, a a lover of musical theater your whole life. Where did this begin? Where did you first get introduced to musicals? Well, I was born in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the tender age of about six or six, five or six years old, my mother, um, who loved um, the uh, the MGM musicals, uh, MGM films, uh, just used to take me to the cinemas to watch them as she needed someone to go with her. And I just developed my my love and and appreciation of the uh, musical theater form. So, so by going to movies, you f- fell in love with musicals. Did you then start to go to live stage musicals as a young boy? Well, of course, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, there's no, there's no such thing as live. No such film. thing. So I, I used to just enjoy uh, the musical theater and the musical scores by listening to the cast albums. Right, and, and you even started to then, collect them, yeah? Yeah, even then when I was young, uh, and the age of seven, six, seven years. So I used to buy them from New York. Uh, I used to sort of save up all my pocket money and 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 then send, I, I found a friend, and uh, Sam Goodies. So I don't know if you remember Sam Goodies record shop. Yes, yeah, Sam Goodies, sure. And the, the, the person who was in charge of exporting, became we became pen pals. Uh, and I used to write to him, I used to send him money to, to build up my credit and then he would send me uh, LPs. And that's where my, my love grew and where I gained all my knowledge. Really. So, so when was the first time that you saw a live performance of a musical? What age? Uh, about 15, 16, when I came to, Lung- came to England, I, I came to a, a boarding school to finish my, um, I guess, O and A levels, which is like senior um, level. 
and and so as soon as I came to to uh, to England, I went to see uh, Hello Dolly. That was your first live musical. My first live uh, performance with Adora Bryan, British uh, comedian. I mean, they did make a cast a cast album with her, so you if you want to hear her performance, you can actually. There is a cast album of Hello Dolly with her. Very nice. And and so when you were a young boy in 15, 16 years old, you're seeing your first musical. Did you have a feeling then that you were going to spend your life dealing in the world of musicals? No, I was I was I was going to be an architect. <laughs> you were going to be an architect. Yes. And I did, <laughs> I did get into a very, very prestigious and good architectural. Um, uh, it's called Architectural Association, uh, uh, which is a, a kind of a university. But I didn't I didn't enjoy my time there. So I. I, I sort of left architecture and went into graphic designing. So I, I got myself a degree, a, a Bachelor of Arts, a BA in graphics. In graphics. Uh, so, so you have a, you have an artistic bent to you, even though you're not a musical theater writer or performer, but you're very artistic. Yes, absolutely. Um, the um, and and of course my 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 uh, qualification of being a graphic designer has actually proven to be very useful. It has saved me hundreds of thousands of pounds of, um, of design work. I bet. Because I work very closely with a very small um, uh, 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 graphic st studio that I promote, that I supported from the very beginning when they first started. And they've always charged me a certain lower rate. And they, they, they would visual, I would visualize the covers and they would execute them for me. Well, well, that uh, saves you lots of money because somebody's not coming up with the original concept. You have the concept. Yeah, a lot of it, of course, uh, a lot of the cast albums, we are, we, are, we, are, we are completely guided and, and, and constrained by the poster of the show. Right. So we adapt the poster, but, but those are studio cast recordings and sometimes, some, sometimes when the posters are not very good, we'll, we'll visualize our own design. And that's where my, my, my graphic design. Got it. So I want to go back about to your world of collecting. Um, at what age did you start collecting? Were you very young? Very young. Um, as I said, when I was in Malaysia, six, six, seven years old. Six, seven years old. Well, what was it that, I mean, how does one get into collecting at that age? What did you, how did you know that you could collect or what, how'd you get there? I guess I'm a born collector. Hence, hence all these, um, I'm surrounded by <laughs> I use this collection really, just collecting. You know? I, you know, the the our listeners can't see the, the what I'm seeing, and I'm what I'm seeing is a very large studio filled to the brim with tons of uh, um, all kinds of albums and all kinds of laser discs and all sorts of things. So you clearly are a collector. Yeah, Blu-rays and CDs and everything else. Uh, you, so that, I, quite frankly, I do not know how I managed it, but I managed it. You know. I just collected and collected. You know. Would you would you say you were obsessive about it? Yes, you were obsessive about it. And I think I asked that question only because I think pretty much everyone who's in the arts, if they're going to be successful in any part of the arts, if they're going to be successful, they have to be a little bit obsessive. Yes, they have to. They have to absolutely have to pour their heart and everything else into what they believe in and what they're interested in, you know. Absolutely. Without it, if you don't have passion for it, probably you're not going to do very well. At least no, I don't think. You lose everything. It, it's because everything. If in it, if, because if you're in it for the money or for the fame, uh, then you're bound to lose everything. Because I, you have to be in it because you believe in it, because you want to do something, because you love it. You know? yeah, yeah, I think that that's a, a very smart to say. Um, because, yeah, if you are in it for the money or the fame, you're not going very far. Not likely. Or if you happen to get lucky and hit it for a little bit, you're not going to stay there very long because no. it's going to show. And sometimes the adage, a hit, whether it be a hit record or hit something, can actually be the, the undoing of you. Really? So, so get, I, well, I'd rather you not give me an example so we don't embarrass anybody. But uh, yes, it's right. Sometimes somebody gets a big hit out of something and that's the end of them because they only think about the next hit instead next of doing hit. the work. Exactly. It's like a, a record company. If you're an independent record company and if you have a hit album, a hit single, then to maintain the hit single and to, to try to get the next one, to, you keep pouring more and more money and resources into the process. And of course, the second hit may not come and, and the maintenance of that hit single may not 
be there. It might just die within a few days after you pour everything into it. And then suddenly you find, I spent all this money, but the single has gone. So, so in the early days, your money, if I, re, if I understand your story correctly, the money that you used to start producing came from your collection. You sold your collection, right? Or you sold part of it. Yes, being, being a collector, um, you do realize that there is a network of collectors around the world mm -hmm. uh, who would collect and who would value the uh, CDs. Or, and, and in those days, they were LPs for the rarity. And the rarity values would be determined the, the cost and, and, and the amount of money that that, that rare, rare album would, would get and, and how much you would have to pay. I have paid a lot of money for certain albums, but, but I do, uh, I, I have sold a lot of rare albums for a lot of money. So and when so, you, do you, do you feel attached to them? Is it hard for you to let them go? It was heart wrenching, but then you see, the thing is that my, my musical taste changed. Um, I, I was, very into music, musical theater and everything around it, including, you know, nostalgic uh, uh, actors and, every, and, and, and stars who, who sang. I collected their albums too, you see, and film soundtracks, I collected film soundtracks as well. But then, but then my, my taste changed when I became really obsessive about opera, which I still am. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so then I, re I started collecting opera uh, recordings. Then, then I suddenly I'm surrounded by all these thousands of musical theater albums as LPs that I no longer play. Then I thought, oh, I, 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 I should really get rid of them because my, my opera, opera albums are pushing them out. <laughs> and so instead of just selling them to, secondhand, to a secondhand dealer, I knew that there was a collector's market. And so I put a couple of small uh, uh, advertisements in a couple of magazines. Um, one was done by the gramophone magazine and one was films and filming. And, um, and, the, and those are international magazines. And the response from around the world was just overwhelming, you know. Um, and uh, I, then I started selling them mail order uh, on collector's prices. Uh, normally they're quite, quite reasonable, uh, you know, they're normal price. But some albums are sold for then, way back in the, in, in the, in the, in the 70s, early 70s. Um, I was I was selling some of some albums for five hundred pounds, a thousand pounds. Wow! Yeah, you know, and 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 there, and there were people paying paying for those because I paid hundreds of pounds for some of those collector's items. Wow! But remember, if we didn't have uh, CD duplications and all sorts of things, a rare LP was a rare LP, right? Sure. You, know, you can duplicate an LP or like you can duplicate a CD now. So don't, no, I, I did, and then and then and so. So I was working as a graphic designer then. Then I, I realized that my answering some letters in the evening was earning me more money than me earning as a graphic designer in a week, you know? So I thought my, my priorities were all wrong. I chucked my, my graphic designing job um, uh, out and, and concentrated on, on doing a mail order uh, business. Um, the mail order business actually worked because, because of the high value of some of the, the items some collectors from somewhere I said, look, I would love to have this, but I can't pay you 800 pounds. But if I gave you 200 pounds plus six albums, would you do the exchange? And then I realized that from my collect, uh, corresponding with other collectors, that if I took those six albums, I have six collectors waiting for them. And I could actually make more money than, than, than the 800 pounds. Oh, wow, very I smart. Them, if I sold them at 300 pounds each, I would have made like, 1,200 pounds instead of 800 pounds, you know? All right, all right, so at what point, at what point in this whole process did you then think to yourself, why don't I start making these? Well, huh? the thing is I had a shop first uh, because the mail order business just grew and grew and grew. And then I, 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 I needed to, uh, to get out of the, of the flat. I was living in the flat with my partner then because it wasn't fair on him. And, um, and, um, and so um, uh, because of all these secondhand records, I started buying them from, from, from secondhand shops. I, there are a few uh, secondhand record shops around England and London. I would go to Scow and, and to pick up, I know what were the rare albums. Right. And I used to pay next to nothing for them really, like one pound, 50p, 99p. And I used to go around and, and buy all those things up. And then, uh, and, then I, and then I would have a lot of stock but they were, they were good stock. So 
I decided that I had to get them out of the house, out, out of the home. And so I started a shop, a specialist shop uh, in London. Uh, the first shop was in Drury Lane. And it was a specialist shop. It was one of its kind in the whole world. There wasn't any other record shop because it only, only sold, sold um, musical theatre, wow. soundtrack, musical theatre and put personalities. All as well as new, collectors items as well as new ones. And that, that became a huge success um, um, because we got customers from all over the world and from corporations and radio stations and TV stations from all over the world, well, EU, from France and Germany and Spain and, and all over England because they needed to, like for example, if uh, the, when I remember this time when, when, when BBC wanted to interview Lauren Bacall uh, and she was in London doing applause, uh, they didn't have the, the cast album to applause, to play as part of their interview with her, you know? So they, so they had to buy from us. <laughs> uh, uh, they us and said, have you got Lauren Bacall's cast uh, applause? Said, yeah, of course we have, you know? So they, and then they, they gave us, gave us a, a, a standing order to supply them every new musical theatre from London and Broadway. Wow, wow. Uh, has to come up without that and just, and just build them, you know? And we had this kind of, this kind of con commissions from all the radio stations and TV stations from all over Europe and everything. So, so you, had, you had a kind of monopoly on theatre recordings. Yes. You were the go-to guy. Yes, and then subsequently uh, the other shops, one in New York and, and another one in London started, but we were the pioneers. And, uh, and, and then we moved to Covent Garden when, when, when the Piazza uh, invited um, 43 interesting businesses to apply uh, for the 43 units. This is the Piazza in the middle of Covent Garden. I don't know if you've been there. I, I have, but, beautiful. Yeah, when it first, first opened, there were 43, well, 49 units actually. Um, and they invited all the businesses to, to go for tendering there, you know. And there were tens of thousands of applications, but we were one of the lucky ones because we were so unusual and were perfect for the location, being a theatrical uh, based um, uh, business. And so when we went in there, uh, we could become even more um, uh, successful because we now have passing trade. On our previous uh, uh, unit um, in Drury Lane, we, we didn't have passing trade because we were in the precinct of a hotel. People have to search us, but now we have passing trade. And it just, just completely took off. Um, and um, I was really flush with cash at the time. Wow. And, um, and that's when, when I needed to expand as any business says, uh, when it become too successful. I thought rather than opening a second shop, I should start a record label. So this was in the late 70s, 1980, somewhere in there? Late, um, mid 70s, late 70s. Late 70s. And and then, so, so that was a decision that was a, a business decision that you've been selling all these records. Why don't you make a few? Yeah? Yes, exactly. And, and so what was the, the very first one was, was um, Nashville, New York. Was that it? Yes. Now, and, uh, the thing is that right from the very beginning, I knew that I couldn't just start a record label and compete with the mics in the room, the, 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 the EMI and the BMG and the, and the, and the, and the CBS and you know, uh, I couldn't compete with them. I have to do something that is unusual, right. that, is, that, that has a niche and that has a claim for itself. Being, having bought and dealt with all the major record companies as a shop, I knew that all those major companies have no idea what to do with musical theater recordings. They know that they could record a hit show and sell a lot while the show is running. But once the show is finished, they have no idea what to do with it. Right, it for sure. Back catalog and then get deleted. And so I knew that I, I, I knew that I had an advantage over these major labels as far as musical theater cast mm. albums. But I knew I had to find a niche. I knew I had to find a way, an angle. And so right from the very beginning, I decided that I really uh, should try to record only worthwhile shows, um, um, uh, important shows. Um, uh, works that are that are that are that, that they can stand the test of time and they have a, of a certain quality. I wasn't in it to to make money or to record a show to make money. I I wanted to keep the artistic integrity of all the shows. Right. And that, that that's my driving force till today, and that's yes. my main principal idea of my catalog. Is there is there a kind of show that you gravitate toward? Is there a style show or genre mm -hmm. of show? 
No, no, no. I mean, you take the first, the first one. Uh, it's you have Ogden Nash, you have Kurt Thau, you have Vernon Duke. Mm -hmm. I mean, three giants of the of the of the of the of music, not only not only musical theater, but the music world. You know, um, and um, and it's a review based on based on the writings of Ogden Nash with music by Kurt Thau and, and Vernon Duke. And and I just thought, thought that was that was a perfect. Um, uh, candidate for my first album and it was yeah, a live I, recording in the theater yes yes that's a funny story to, to to that actually sure uh, well because because i was young i was young and i was green i didn't know what i was doing but then there was a, a young man um sort of like we were we were practically babies really <laughs> and just graduated from uh, from his sound uh, degree or whatever and um, he, and then he said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll record for you, um, which means that he'll do it for love and, um, and um, for experience. And I said, OK, fine, you know, why not? So, <laughs> OK, and we, we arranged to record that show live at, uh, at the last performance of it. OK. So he and he, uh, bless him, he wanted to save me money, but he, 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 he had a professional machine. But uh, but he wanted to save me money by buying just one reel of professional tape <laughs> for that for that um, machine because he didn't realize so he said we, we recorded the whole of Act One and then and then and then he turned the tape around like a home a domestic uh, machine you know oh. and then we record on the other side bless him he wanted to save me money those tapes were quite expensive you know at that time right so not a recording but but of course it's pulled forward and so there was all these blank tapes at the end of Act One. Then he started um, recording Act Two, which is on the blank part of the tape, and and of course, as you know, professional tape machines record one way; they use the entire tape. Yes. Okay. And so Act Two started eating into the end of Act One, as oh. um, as, 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 <laughs> as this was the last performance, but mercifully it it only ate into the last number, and guess what was the last number of Act One? The most famous Kurt Bow song, Speak Low, the hit song <laughs> of the show. So we got the cast album of Nashville, New York, but we don't have the hit song. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't blame him really, poor thing. But he did go on to greater great to greater glory because he, he I think he opened them, um, uh, he was responsible for something called um, autograph sounds, I think. That, that started doing all the West End shows. Uh, they were the sounds. What, what's the sounds. his name? I know who you're talking about. Autograph sounds. But I can't remember his name. Uh, well, anyway, um, I, I recently had on the show Jonathan Deans, who's a world famous theater sound designer. Yes, um, I think he's before Jonathan Dean, I think. Before Jonathan Deans. Do, do you know who Jonathan is? Have you heard I know of him? Jonathan Dean, yes. Oh, sure. Well, he's uh, you know one of the very best there is in the world. Right. Right. Um, all so, right, so, uh, so, so, he so, so, a, a big so how him. many, how many shows did you do before you started to think to yourself, you know what, I am pretty good at being a producer and I can make money with this. How, how long did that take? Uh, well, it's hard to tell because I think I have been very lucky. Uh, I, uh, I hit, um, I, luck, lady luck came on, came to me from very earlier on. Right. By the uh, by the uh, the fifth uh, by the fifth album, I was already recording a, a West End hit show, um, uh, Hell Joey with uh, Sean Phillips and Dennis Lawson. Okay. And uh, and, and and the biggest the biggest uh, uh, luck the biggest uh, chance that came, I think it was the, it was the eleventh or the twelfth album, where I suddenly out of I mean this don't forget I was still a, an independent small label. Okay. You were just figuring it out. You didn't know what you were doing quite. No, I mean, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I, I, I did. I did engage the best in the in the business. Mm -hmm. That's what I know. Even though I, I and they were all very good to me. They didn't charge me the regular rates. They they they, they knew what I was doing and they were supportive of me. So uh, like I had I had the world famous record producer Norman Newell. Okay. Um, he was a, a, the chief producer for a lot of EMI recordings. I mean, his fee was thousands, but he only charged me five hundred pounds to 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 produce. Uh, wow, my, you know, you, and uh, you, but are, I did you are lucky. 
I did reward him by taking him to Broadway to, re to produce his first Broadway cast album. He's done a lot of London cast album, but he's never ever done a Broadway cast album. Right. So I did that at 500 pounds because it was a fixed price. <laughs> wow. But, uh, but anyway, by, by 11, uh, the 11th thing, I had a phone call from, um, from uh, Channel 4. Um, at that time, we only had three television channels, BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. Right. And the first channel was being introduced to the British uh, population. It was all very exciting. And, um, and I got this phone call from, from, from the music department of Channel 4. And they said, um, look, we are starting, we are starting this new channel and, and we got this prestigious 12 part um, uh, adaptation of the Royal Shakespeare Company's production of um, the, the, the Lives and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby. Okay. And, and there's a lot of music and some, a lot of songs in it. Would you like to release a soundtrack album? Was this the Roger Rees version, yeah. Nicholas Nickleby? Yes. Yes. And that was the flagship program because it was like the first, on the first day of the broadcast, that was one of the programs. I see. Uh, and um, and it was twelve episodes, and so uh, and so would I like of course I would, and they didn't they didn't ask for any advance or anything, but they just gave it to me, and um, and then and then I said well, you will have to promote the album of course I said sure we we'll put original soundtrack album on, on TER record at the end of this program you know, and of course uh, of course uh, that was a huge success and we sold tens of thousands of that LP you know, wow, real, real thing. and that was a real big big break. Um, so, and, so you, so you, how many recordings do you think you do a year? Or were you doing back then? How many shows? When, when at the height of my, uh, at the height of my, uh, my uh, uh, recording, uh, my my labels um, um, career, um, I think I was doing like twenty odd albums a year. Well, that's a lot. Twenty albums a year. That's more yeah. than one. That's almost two a month. Yeah, because I was recording Broadway and West End. Uh, uh, recordings and sometimes European recordings as well. You know, were okay. most of, were most of these live recordings or were they in the studio? In the studio. In the studio. Because quality was very important to me. We were the first to record in digital, pure digital. All the BMG tried to claim when they when they just remastered in digital. That, that is a, no, we were we were the first to record in pure DDD. Do you know? Wow. Do you know mm -hmm. By DDD. Yes. Remember those? Remember those? A D D A A D and D D D. I do remember. D D D. D D D. You were digital and, uh, all the way. So there was no analog at all. Recording, digital mastering, and digital 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 mixing. Digital recording, digital digital mixing, and digital mastering. D D D. Right. So and, uh, and uh, so no quality was very important to me. I, I always use Abbey Road. Um, as almost almost. Well, at the beginning, I had ties to the business no longer. But then soon after that, I, I, I was Abbey top client uh, for years, for about 30, 35 years, you know. So, so you, were, um, you were the top yeah. client? Yes, because I was involved in a project. Um, uh, again, this is luck. I was involved in a project that, um, that netted me millions. Wow. Millions, because... I knew that I was the only source that they could get what they wanted to get at that time when, when the project started. In that, they, they, I, I don't know if you're familiar with what I call hard works. In Europe and in England, it was very popular. Every, every, every fortnightly, there is a magazine, a dedicated magazine, like for example, to guitar music, to uh, opera, to classical, to um, um, you know, jazz. Uh, a magazine every two weeks on, on particular subjects. And then they give you a free CD attached to the, to the magazine. Uh, and it's like, like a collecting that they, they would release about a hundred in the series. Um, and then, you know, so, so they had the collection called the opera collection, the classical collection, the guitar collection, the jazz collection with, with a CD attached to you know, every week with a dedicated subject on that genre. And were you and, were you producing all those? Well, well, they 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 wanted to do the musicals collection. Of course, at first they um, they um, they wanted to do to use the original Broadway cast, the original London cast, the original cast recording. Right. But as we know, I'm sure you know your agreement with BMG on Jack and Hyde. 
BMG is severely restricted and 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 and, and, and in what they can do with the recording. They may Absolutely. own the rights. They may own the rights, but they can't just release it as a budget album and things like that because all this are, are inherent in 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 the, the because I know because I have I have I have seen all these um, uh, uh, recording agreements, um, uh, and so uh, I knew that they couldn't get any of those Broadway class recordings uh, or Western class recordings because those major record companies cannot cannot give them a hundred recordings of their top shows, you know, just like that, for to be given away, you know, because they're there by. The idea is that you buy the magazine, you get the free CD. Right. So, they, so uh, uh, Sony cannot give them My Fair Lady to be given away as part of the magazine. So, but I had a sizable collection, a sizable number of, of recordings of these um, of these musicals uh, that when they came came to me, I said, okay, I will um, I will I will do it. Uh, but they wanted a hundred titles. I said, look, let's do seventy five. And I said, I will, I will, I have, I have a, quite a lot already that I can give them, because because my agreements with the producers and with the authors for all my class albums are completely uh, uh, unhindered. Yeah, they're, they're, they're free. You, you I, I, can I do whatever that, you want with them. Yes. Yes, I realized I could not have any restrictions, because I told them. I, I mean, I, it's the truth. I'm not going to. I'm not going to exploit them. I'm not. In fact, because of that, they made a lot of money to the mechanicals. Um, um, I, I, of course, I'm not just going to give them away, but I need to be free to 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 be able to recoup whatever way I can because I'm a small independent company. Mm -hmm. Spending two three hundred thousand dollars to make a cast album at that time, I needed to to have everything I can at my disposal to try to recoup as much as I can in any way. You know. So all my agreements are completely um, um, uh, un, what's the word? Un unhindered anyway. Unhindered uh, is a good word. Unencumbered. Yeah. Unencumbered. Yeah, they're totally unencumbered. And so I told them I could do that. And then those that I didn't have, and I didn't have a lot of the major uh, titles like West Side Story and My Fair Lady and things like that. I will then record them with the original orchestrations and with stars. Broadway and Western stars to make them sound. They will sound almost. They will sound almost like a cast album because they are the original Broadway orchestrations, the original Western orchestrations, and they will be performed by stars, mostly stars who have already played the part in, in one production or another. Right. So, uh, but I, but because I knew that I was the only company that they could possibly realize this project of theirs, I I did a very um, tight, a very um, um, advantageous agreement for myself with them. You know, I asked for a royalty um, uh, on uh, on each unit. I asked for a fee, and uh, you know, uh, so I, I'm control. And so um, I knew that I knew that I, I was at an advantage. So so they, they had no choice; they had to agree. Uh, and um, and so um, so it means that that once the pro once the the, the series started. I have to I have to make sure they get two classic title cast recordings right. a month, and so I was I was living in Abbey Road because then I was negotiating to get the rights to record the original orchestrations to, to get the stars big stars and lesser stars from West End and from Broadway going to New York to record going you know but I I was like practically recording living in Abbey Road like every day. I probably had about at the time I would probably go to Abbey Road at, at nine o'clock in the morning, do a, a, a ten, 10 o'clock start session. That be there all day, and then when the sessions finish, I would then stay on to mix the last session, and then we'll mix, 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 mix till about two, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Wow. Get go to sleep, and then wake up again next morning. We'll do the same thing. And while I'm recording at Abbey Road, uh, uh, trying to deal with the starts and the orchestra and everything else. I had to deal with getting rights for the next one. You know, I would have the score that I'm recording on my desk. I would have the score that I'm, I'm negotiating. I would be recording South Pacific, but I have guys and dolls next to me talking to the estate and lawyers and God knows what a Frank Lass said to negotiate the rights to use them. And then and then I'll be I'll be calling New York um, 
uh, to, to, to have the stars, you know, to sing this. It was wonderful, but again, luck was on my side because I had a lot of goodwill. I mean, from the most amazing people like, you know, the Leonard Bernstein estate and the Frank Lesser and Charles Strauss and Alan J. Lerner and all, they were all behind me. And all, the, and all the agents for all the stars were all behind me. They knew, I guess they all thought, knew that what I was doing. Um, well, once you started to make recordings that they knew were of a high quality, then that uh, word gets around. It's a, small, it's a small business, really. And yes. word gets around and suddenly you're the go-to guy that they know they're going to get a quality production out of. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it was all quality. They knew it was quality. They knew it be, their works will be respected. I'm not, just, I'm not just, just going to make a, 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 tin, a tinny, tinny cheap recording of, of their, 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 their work, you know, it will be a major uh, thing. And um, anyway, um, so West Side Story was the first issue that came out of this magazine. Right. Well, guess how, 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 how many did they sell? 1.8 million. How, how many? 1.8 million? 1. 8 million wow, this. that's a lot of records. And so, and so, of course, the Bernstein and, uh, and Stater were thrilled because the mechanicals are 100 million, you know, just for this, uh, this studio so, report. So for the listeners, you've, you've used the term mechanicals twice. Let's, for the listeners, explain what, is, what does it mean in the, in the uh, recording business or in the publishing business? What are mechanicals? Well, mechanicals are the royalties for the composers, for the writers. Mm -hmm. Every record uh, in, 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 in this country, in England, is, is, um, it used to be 8%, but now I think it's 9.5% of the, of the wholesale price right. of, of an album. If, if the album is sold for £3, it's 8.9%, 9.5% of £3. I, I, um, love, but, I love mechanicals. Yes, of course we do. <laughs> but in America, I think it's nine nine point five cents. Okay. The trouble with this her songs mechanical system in America, which is very advantageous for the the, the, the writers, but uh, but uh, but it, it does it does restrict the, the releases because especially in musical theater scores. In musical theater scores, as you well know, uh, with the Jack and Hell, I'm sure you had the same thing. It, it's always based on a percentage of. Uh, it's not 100 percent; it's 75 percent, and exactly. And just it gets, it gets whittled down. By the time the mechanicals get to an, uh, the writer, it's very yeah. little compared to the whole. Yeah, but you see, but the thing is that that, that is quite restrictive. Um, even then, that's quite restrictive because, like for example, in England, it doesn't matter if it's 50 tracks or if it's 25 tracks, if it's three tracks. It's based on 8.5 uh, percent of the the wholesale the wholesale price. The price. The price. If it's a double, triple album, it doesn't matter. It's based on whatever the wholesale price of that is. A right, of right. Like there was one. There was one. I give you one example. There was one one recording which I made, which is a lovely little recording for the Taffetas. And the, the Taffetas? Taffetas. The Taffetas. Okay. It's, uh, it's a female version of the um, the 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 plaids. You know the. Um, oh, uh, forever plaid. Yeah, forever plaid. It's a female version because the Taffetas uh, is the journey through the fabulous 50s of all the, okay. the female uh, solo and, and group songs. But that, 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 that cast album has something like about 30 or 40 tracks. Okay. And, um, and uh, because a lot of it are medleys and, 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 um, and, and, it, got, and it covered up. And then the worst thing about it is that all the different writers you know, involved. Oh, well, in each that, 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 putting that together must be crazy from getting rights when you have to get that many different writers. Well, they, they got the rights for the, for, for the performance because I think they got, they got it through ASCAP or something like that. All right. They got the rights for the performance. But because I was an English company and I did the cast album in New York, but a British company recording and then bring it back to England to release in England. We don't have to, I don't have to deal with any of the writers or the publishers. I just deal with the mechanical company of MCPS. I just send them the license of all the songs because they represent. They have the. They have the. 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 Um, the. the uh, what's the word? One. They had. They had the rights to represent all writers all around the world because the writers have signed over through their publishers to give the MCPS the rights to collect on their behalf and to I represent. I see. I see. So MCPS didn't have to go and negotiate with anybody. They just. If the song is published by them, by a publisher, and, and all the hit songs were published in England by the publisher, 
MCPS represent them. And MCPS, it's only for me, it's for every record label. Right. MCPS just granted the license for 40, uh, 39 songs uh, with no problem. I didn't have to negotiate with anybody. So they and just, you can just, you can just pick whatever songs you want and it's part of the package. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I recorded the whole show. Um, and so, and so for us to record, uh, to release the, um, uh, the cast album, there's no problem. We just pay eight, eight and a half percent of whatever we, we uh, the dealer price of the album was and, and, and pay MCPS for that. Whereas an American company would never be able to release the cast album unless they, they spend months and months and months negotiating with all the different publishers and all the different writers to, uh, you know, to, 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 to all agree to be on the same favorite nation rates. So that's the advantage of being British, British as well. All right, so I'm curious, uh, today, or even back then, but today, when you decide to take on a new project, or back then when you were trying to decide which projects to do, how did that work? How did you decide I'm going to do this show or not that or that show? Was it you making those decisions or were people coming to you and asking you to record them? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And mostly it's me uh, because um, I, um, my decision, because, because I've decided, as I said very early on, that I'm not in it for the money. Now, the reason why I'm able to do all these uh, complete recordings, and basically they were all financed by me uh, in that because of that project, uh, you know, that, that type of projects, um, I was earning millions from that project. And so I could be very cash rich at the moment if I just, um, oh, I, I decided to just give them 12 songs. I said, look, you can't have the whole score. You can, for, the, for your part work, you can only have 12 of the big songs uh, from the score. And so, and so I could have just recorded 12 songs. Like I could have just recorded 12 main songs of West Side Story. Right. But then I thought to myself, if I'm going to take the trouble to negotiate with the Bernstein estate and everything to do, to use their, their original orchestrations and, um, and the stars to sing in them, I might as well negotiate to record the whole show, the whole score, everything from, from the first note to the last note, uh, because it's the same negotiation. Right. And when I, when, I, when I engage the stars, in, rather than me saying, oh, I, I engage you to sing three songs, these three songs, I just say, I engage you to sing the role. You know? do, you, do you make the decision which stars to go after, or does somebody else help you with that decision? No, I do that. You do that. You decide, in this show, I'm going to have X star, and I'm going to have Y star. You make that decision. I make that decision. It's, that you, it's, awesome. it's your production from beginning to end. Yes. How, do you, how do you then, so I know I've seen pictures of you with various stars and with um, very famous composers like Stephen Sondheim. Um, yes. Do you invite them into the studio, the composers, if they're alive, do you invite them into the studio with you? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I, because I think uh, some people don't like to have the orchestrator or the producers or the writers or, what, or the writers or orchestrators. Because sometimes they can get a little fussy. But you see, for me, I, I have a completely different different take. I, I think them being there and them being fussy and being awkward, it's not because they were being fussy and awkward for the sake. They want it to be good. Because they care. Yeah, they and, care, sure. And because I care and they see the way I work, they trust me. And and so we always have a very good, we always had a very, I, I don't know, ever had a, a bad experience with any of these uh, 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 heavy, Top guns, you know. do, do you do most of your recording in England or do you do some of it in America as well? I, I, I record half half. I mean, I did a lot of recordings in New York as well. Because I so you're, of, you're, you're coming across the ocean a lot yeah. then, yeah? Yes, I mean, there was a time when I was in, New, I was in America about maybe uh, eight times a year. And, yeah. and do, you, do you find that the attitudes toward the productions are similar on both sides of the pond or are they different? Is there a difference between British... Uh, composers and writers and American composers and writers? Is there, is there a difference that you find? Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, um, uh, you, you would have thought that it would be easier with British writers. But it's difficult to get to the, to the place in America, okay? Right. The negotiations yeah. sort of initially were difficult. But it's not so, not so difficult with it. Uh, it's, in fact, it's almost as difficult with the British, but once you're in, once you're in the studio or in the situation with an American uh, counter, uh, writer or whatever, or performer, 
and if they trust you, it's a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. But with British, uh, the trust and the <laughs> and the uh, the ability to to let go uh, a bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> they want to hold the reins a little tighter. Yeah, and this goes with performance. Surprisingly, I've I've recorded a lot of very big names and big stars in America with no problem. Right. But I did have some problems, but even lesser names, names that are quite meaningless to a lot of people. But I do have problems with them over here. <laughs> are, they, are they also trying to improve the product or are they sometimes there's no reason for it? No, I think it's to do with uh, security, insecurity. Insecurity, sure. Yeah, because, because, because like, for example, when I work with Glenn Close, I mean, she was a piece of cake, you know, I mean, I mean, I even told her how to act. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, okay, John, if you think that's right, then there's no problem, you know? Well, when I said to her how to act, and basically she was uh, in, one, in, one, in one sequence where she had to introduce a song and she, it, she did it perfectly, but I just wanted her to sound like she was in the Royal Albert Hall because she was supposed to be in the Royal Albert Hall to talk to an audience of a, a thousand in front of her. And although she did talk, and she did project, but it just wasn't enough for the sonic sonically. You so wanted her to be. Her. You wanted her to be bigger in the moment. Yeah. So I, I said to her, "Look, Glenn, just imagine that you are now in front of ten thousand people, and they have to hear you from the back. Just make your announcement for them. <laughs> you know. So and and she did it perfectly. You know. So all right. Aside but once. In England, but in England, sometimes I do have to struggle with. Well, I'm. I, I can only do it this way. That's all you're they, gonna get. <laughs> they're they're stuck in what they believe it should be. Well, I think with a big star, they're so secure with their status, with where they are. They have no worries about having to prove anything. But with the ones that are upcoming, they are so insecure. They want to prove. They want to control. They want to be careful, and they want to make sure that they are not compromised. I see. I That's see. Important. I see. So all right. So. What, how do you decide what shows you want to do? How do you make those decisions? Well, as I said, um, it's all to do with my take on the quality of the work, uh, the, the, the criteria, the, 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 uh, the, the people involved, the writers, uh, they all have to be of a certain standard, you know? I mean, I have, I have promoted and supported a lot of upcoming new young writers, but my mainstay are usually with, with writers that are really already considered great writers. Established, well-known writers. Established, well-known, but of a, of, a, of a certain quality, you know, not, not, not just well-known, but writing a lot of popular well, stuff. Well, obviously, I mean, when you're talking about Sondheim and Bernstein and Kander and Ebb and Lerner and Lowe and Rodgers and Hammerstein, they're, <laughs> they're, the, they're the best of the best. Yeah. Well, Kurt Vau, for example. The best of I the best. Believe. I can't believe that, that here we are, a, a Malaysian Chinese who is British, and I'm holding the torch for Kurt Vau's at Broadway Works. <laughs> My company is the only company that has the complete recording of Lady the Dark, the complete really? recording of, of One Touch of Venus. I have a complete recording of Street Scene and Three Penny Opera. So Lady in the Dark and One Touch of Venus, no other record companies in the world Got those recordings. Yes, there was a Mary Martin recording of of, uh, of One Touch of Venus, but there were only eight songs from it, you know. And and in fact, she sang songs that she didn't sing in the show. She sang songs that other people sang. So basically, that eight songs cast album is not a really cast album. It's just eight songs from One Touch of Venus. It's it's, it's a taste recording. of the show. It's not the whole show. Yeah. yeah, I have the complete recording of the original version of the original orchestrations. Um, and, and I've got some wonderful Broadway names uh, in it, uh, Melissa Errico. And, um, and so, you know, I'm so, 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 so for me, it was quality rather than, than, uh, than um, a commercial. All commercial. right. So once you, once you go into production, what are the biggest challenges for you? You've already got the rights. You've set up the stars. You've got the orchestra. You're recording all the music. You're recording the vocals. What, what are the biggest challenges in production for you? It's, uh, it's, I, I've always, uh, right, I don't know if, if you're familiar with my recordings, I've always, right from the very beginning, um, uh, went for the natural 
sound, the natural balance. Because for my love of the opera recordings, the opera and the opera recordings, and watching opera in the opera houses, uh, they are not amplified. They are not. They are natural. The natural dynamics, the natural balance, um, and that's what I, I I strive for in my in my uh, in my recordings. I don't close mic. I don't. Um, I don't um, uh, conde- uh, uh, compress to control the, the the dynamics. I record the full dynamics, and and the, the big challenge is to then translate the full dynamics because sometimes it can get very soft and it can get very loud. Uh, and 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 is 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 to without compromising the loudness and the softness is to mix it in such a way that it lives in a very happy band, you know. Um, so you uh, want it to feel live? Yes, all my recordings are, are performances rather than recordings. Got it. So yeah. so you don't you don't go back and cut a lot. You want to rec- you want to capture something that feels live. Yes, and this is what I tell all the people that work that recorded for me the stars. Or, or not, um, is I just want them to give me a performance. Like for example, on a lot of studio cars uh, that I've done, and I'll tell you the reason why I do studio cars in a minute, uh, is that I told, I, I always said, I want a performance from you. I, I, I think, I don't care about you singing the correct notes because you can't sing the correct notes. Otherwise they won't be here. Right. You know, don't worry about singing the perfect, beautiful notes. I want the performance. I want you to mean what you're saying, what you're singing, the words and feel the emotion and feel the orchestra because orchestrations are very important uh, in my recordings. The orchestrations are not there just to have pretty back, backing, backing sound to the singing. The orchestrations work with the drama, you know, and the orchestrators, Jonathan Tunick loves my recordings um, because um, he knows that I would take care of his orchestrations. Sure. I mean, the orchestrations heighten the emotions and help with the drama and propel and drive, you know, and so that's what I tell them. I, I want a performance. I don't want a, re- a recording from you. You're not looking for a, the absolute pristine perfection. You're looking for passion and guts. Yes, but of course, the, the perfection and everything else has to come hand in hand with it, you know? Well, obviously, if somebody's singing off key or out of tune, you're not going to release that. So it has to be right. But you're. Yeah. But on top of that, you're looking for something that feels... I don't want to use the word raw. It's not raw. It's, it's live. It feels like they're yes. actually performing yes. for you yes. rather and than you've gone in and done a lot of production to it. Yes. And when they, and, and, and like for example, in the dialogue, for example, a lot of producers tend to say, oh, we have recorded dialogue separately, uh, you know, after we, we've taken care of the song. But no, I, I want the dialogue to be part of the recording of the song. Because mm. if you're going to have a dialogue before the song, the, 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 the dialogue... Uh, um, the energy of the dialogue has to lead into the song. Uh, you know, when you're speaking something and you're, I know you're going to be singing the song and you speak it in a different way to, to sing to sing the song, you know. Whereas if you just recorded the dialogue on its own, yeah, perfect. You can you get all the words down. But when you when you added them together, you hear the difference that suddenly the energy dropped off or it just doesn't match. The sound doesn't match, you know, the ambience doesn't match. So I tend to always record the dialogue with the with with the with the um, with the uh, the singing. As that one goes thing. that goes back to your philosophy of making a performance. The performance is yes. a whole thing. It's yes. not bits and pieces. Yes, and which also, which is uh, why I think sometimes movie musicals today don't work so well because they feel no. they feel not like a, a whole performance. No, in fact, when I listen to, to I can't bear to listen to soundtracks anymore. Uh, for a long time, I can't bear to listen because. All the soundtrack uh, albums are so badly mixed and so badly put together. Mm-hmm. You, know, you get a dialogue up in your face, uh, and then suddenly the singing is like miles away uh, because they added it from the dialogue to the, the singing. And the right. Thing. So I want to talk for a moment about Anyone Can Whistle, which you released in December of 2020. Um, yeah. It took you, t- you had the recording for 23 years before you released it. I'm just curious about the story about that. Why did it take 23 years to release it? But I tell you, it's very simple. It's just I just didn't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to record. Uh, Anyone can be so. I knew, I knew that that, that at that time I was really close uh, with uh, Arthur Lawrence and so on. Time because I've done some recordings with them, and right. Sondheim took me totally. And um, and I knew that I could just get the rights to record that. I mean, they 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 they, they were thrilled and delighted when I asked them 23 years ago. And I said, I like, I want to record a complete recording of Animal Can Be So, you know, of the original version. Uh, 
so I needed I needed to recover. It's just enough time because 23 years ago to 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 fairly recently, I've been so busy recording loads and loads. I, I was flying over to New York and, and you know, everywhere um, recording. I just didn't have the time. I got another 12 complete recordings tied up. I paid for all that. And even if I don't release them, I don't care because I, 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 I didn't miss the money. They did cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. You, you, ha you have 12 recordings you have yet to release? Yes. Wow. You don't want to say what they are, I assume. Well, I can mention a few. Well, mention that, mention um, what you can mention. Uh, Fiddle on the Roof, complete, <laughs> the only complete recording. We're starring who? Who who did you have playing Tevye? Len who Carey. Was, Len Carey, you? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he was an. I, I another thing is I love to have offbeat, weird, sometimes weird casting. He sang it brilliantly. I He's bet. Of Octavia is wonderful. It's very down to earth. It's very down to earth. No, I've got the music man. I've got, um, and you know who I got for the music man? No. Um, uh, uh, God, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Cox. Oh, Brian Cox? Brian who, Cox. Who, who's British, guy. right? Or Scottish? Yeah. Is he British or Scottish? I don't know which. Hannibal, Hannibal, um, uh, what's this? You know, he, he played Hannibal. Um, uh, what's his name? The the the, the flesh eating man, uh, Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter. He did that. Uh, not not the film, but he did a television uh, version. Anyway, Brian Cox is brilliant. You know why? Because he actually did play the part of the professor in a production in London. Okay. Uh, that wasn't recorded, so I thought, okay, I'll I'll, I'll record him, and he's brilliant. And I have Forty um, Second Street. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Brigadoon. Brigadoon, sure. Hair. Hair? Well, yeah. ha ha you know, hair needs to be revived. Ha yeah. Hair sort of has disappeared into the woodwork a little bit. Yeah, and these are all complete recordings. This will be the only complete recordings of these scores. Do, do you have a plan for releasing them over time? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know I think I'm going to get to the next one uh, sometime soon because, uh, because uh, like, for example, uh, Maybe fate held back uh, anyone can be so uh, to now to last year right. because um, because um, uh, it's time basically I just didn't have the time to 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 get to them but um, uh, last year when the lockdown came in March I thought to myself now what am I going to do uh, with myself locked up at home you know I said okay fine I'll, I'll, I'll because it's on Hans 90th birthday. I said, I'll finish anyone can be so to give him a gift of it, you know. Beautiful, uh, beautiful. My dear birthday gift. And as it turned out, I don't know if you've heard the recording or if you've seen that, seen that, seen the album, the, the book, uh, everything else. I've seen it online, but I haven't heard the recording. Well, the thing is that, um, is that um, very few people know what anyone can be so is really about. All they think about is, oh, if it was an early Sondheim flop in the 60s. But if I released this album last year, I mean, I mean, in 2019 or 2002 or, or whatever, it would be just another release of a new recording of Anyone Can Whistle. Right. But releasing it in 2020, uh, it's so apt and so amazingly um, uh, uncanny that what Anyone Can Whistle is about was completely reflected with what's happening the tsunami of the social and political upheaval in America. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, a, a throwaway line in Anyone Can Whistle, because Anyone Can Whistle is basically about a corrupt uh, mayoress, the okay. leader of Cora, who is greedy, who is ambitious, you know, who, is, is, who, 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 who schemes and exploitative and use miracles and exploit, exploit religious people to, you know, for his support. And a, and a sycophantic corrupt uh, a group of uh, uh, people around her, okay? And, um, and her, her, the town was bankrupt and they have no money and, and, and they're trying to fleece money from everybody. And a throwaway line meant to be funny in the show at that time until this year, last year, until the, the, the pandemic, pandemic. A line where it says, the theaters are dark. <laughs> right? You yeah. would never in a million years think 
oh, you know, the theaters will never be dark, you know. People should say, oh, the theaters are dark, you know, you know the, the shops are closed and shuttered. And, so it's exactly what was happening around the world. The theaters have all gone dark. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. And lines like, uh, she has a song as well, where she says, lock them up, you know, lock them up, lock them up, put them away. Women and children first, throw them in the cages. You know wow. what I mean? It's almost like, like somebody learned the, 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 uh, read the script and, and, and started mouthing them. Including at the end of the show where, she, where she, she didn't want to go and she says, I do not resign. You know, <laughs> you are fired. You are all fired, you know. Well, well that's God like that's like that's like that's like future telling. It's like yeah, God the White House. I'm taking charge, you know. <laughs> I mean that that's that's those words were uttered by by the by Cora. Wow. So basically, anyone can be so re released in 2020 for us was perfect. I could I could promote and market that the whole essence, the political part of it, which a lot of people didn't realize. Was what anyone can visit. So anyone can visit was really a political set satire, and and okay, fine. At the time when they when they wrote it, of course, they didn't think about twenty twenty. It was basically a, a general comment about all the dictators and all the all the all the all the regimes around the world. But it's just such a coincidence that when we read the year that we released this was so much absolutely a mirror of what was happening in America. Uh, people were, were starving and, uh, in the show. People were starving and they were out of work and they were, they were dying and they were poor and all these sort of things. Um, you know, it's well, all that. Well, I'll say this. I hope when you release Fiddler on the Roof, the same thing isn't going on in the world no, at that time. No. <laughs> no, that happened a lot. <laughs> so, anyway, it was a blessing. It was a blessing for me to release that. Uh, well, I, I, if I read the the Sondheim quote at the beginning of the show here in your bio that he, and I'll quote it again, the brilliance of this recording gives the show more energy and sparkle than it's ever had. I assume he was yeah, really I, pleased. Yeah, but hang on. There is a line afterwards which you didn't read. That's the more important line. Oh, what's, a, it's, what's that line? It has made me proud of it. Oh, <laughs> that's a big deal. Yeah, that's the line. It has made me proud of it. And you know what? Sondheim never uh, gives any endorsement for any recordings. Uh, uh, he is absolutely, completely knocked out by this recording. And, and I think the fact that, that, uh, that, that um, because he keeps asking me for CDs, because everybody's going to him saying they heard this and they want to listen to it because he has to give them to all the associates. And you know, he's been playing them to, to big guns, uh, producers, big um, Scott Rudin and, and people who just loved it. And hopefully this recording might, uh, might, 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 well, this recording has already elevated. Well, it's, it's so important. timely in, in, in its form that it might wind up being a big Broadway show again. Well, I, I would rather see it as a, a cutting edge production of it by the National Theatre of London or the Lincoln Centre or something like that, rather than a big Broadway. Um, um, it could be a big Broadway show because the other es essence of anyone can be so which people aren't, in, unless you've seen it uh, the origin, originally, yeah, people are not, because the, the, the cast album, the Broadway cast and the concert cast, because they cut, they didn't record the whole score, the things were cut. People don't realize that it is actually very much a dance musical. Hmm. There's a lot of dance music in it. Big ballet, 12 minute ballet, you know, called hmm. Dolphin wow. Ballet, which when you listen to it, it's almost like coming, it's almost like it came out of West Side Story. Is that on the, on the recording as well, the ballet? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's a complete recording. It's because complete. this complete recording has, has brought out so much more of anyone can do so. And that's why Sondheim is so, so supportive and so pleased with this because I think it's vindicated um, his um, um, disappointment uh, mm, uh, mm. way back. Well, because it was not a hit. It was, uh, it was a flop. It was, it was a flop. And people were always referring to it as one of those difficult flop, you know. But, um, but now it's been referred to as Sondheim's masterpiece, Sondheim's masterwork, and it's a political satire rather than a 60s flop, you know? That, that's a, that's really amazing a when a flop. show can get a resurrection like that. Yeah, by this recording. And it will really tickle me pink if uh, some hotshot director and a great choreographer were to come together and do a performance, a production of the original version without having, having to rewrite because it's all there. It's all in the music. It's all in the writing. 
yeah, it's that's very the, funny as well. That's yeah. that's a, that's brilliant that you hit on that alt. It's just with again, your luck. You're a lucky. You say you're a lucky person. You're just yeah. waited around twenty three years, and there it is. Well, it just happened. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the, the the ultimate accolade that comes from Sean Heim uh, for this recording was uh, out of nowhere. I received an, an email from him on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, he sent he sent me an email. He said, uh, John, he says, on this Thanksgiving day, I'd like to give thanks to you because you made a feast out of a turkey. Oh, oh, oh. what a great line. Yeah. What a great line. I think it's the greatest accolade uh, I, I can get from him. That must have made, your, made you smile ear to ear. Of course. <laughs> no, that's not being head so big. <laughs> So, all right, so I want to just for we're, we're coming toward the end of the show, but I want to ask about distribution um, in this day and age where pretty much everything is streamed and uh, there aren't as many CDs. Certainly there's vinyl still being sold, but nowhere near the numbers and CDs are nowhere near the numbers that they once were. How has streaming affected your business? Uh, well, because it's a niche um, uh, company, a niche uh, business. Uh, uh, we, we appeal to a certain sector, the, the musical theater lovers, and there will always be musical theater lovers, mm -hmm. just like there always be opera lovers and things like that. Even as we speak, there's probably one being born right now, you know? Right. So sure. uh, um, uh, it affected slightly, uh, but it really, I, didn't re I don't really feel uh, that disadvantaged by it. We don't actually believe in streaming as much. Uh, because I don't believe in, uh, in, in, in some businessman just making money out of other people's work, you know, because this is a perfect capitalist uh, structure. You, the, the, the people who own Spotify, they are businessmen, they're not music people. Sure. Uh, and and they, they are they're, they're making money because uh, all the, they, 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 they carved out a huge percentage. I can't, it's probably 60% of the earnings, okay? How perfect is it? You just, you, they don't even have to spend a penny uh, originating. They just take other people's recording, other people's work, put it out, and, and they just sit there and the money rolls in for them. And they just give a little bit to him, a little bit to him, you know. Well, it's, it's, uh, not, a, it's not a little bit, it's a tiny bit. A tiny bit. Uh, <laughs> but meanwhile, they, they, they carved out for administration costs. They buy up, buy up buildings in New York that cost hundred million dollars a, a, a building in London for the headquarters it cost hundred million pounds you know 200 million pounds uh, that's administration cost for them but it belongs to them you know right so uh, so so we don't believe in, in giving our our mass our so catalog. you still sell CDs yes but of course being a realist I created a, a series of releases on of 12 track based on my my deal with the with the magazine. I, I, I've released, uh, I've, I've, I've done 12 tracks versions of all our recordings. So far, we've done about 120, I think. And we put those 12 text version onto, onto the streaming. I see. Uh, like from our, from our complete recording of say South Pacific that has 42 tracks, out of the 42 tracks, 12 tracks from the recording uh, on the South Pacific that is being put on the streaming On site. streaming, I see. That, that's very good well, to your... I, I, I was going to say you have you you you're you've got a foot in that world, but you're not rolling over to the, with that world entirely. No, no, because we get people like say, oh, I want to listen to the complete recording uh, of Metropolis. This was, um, uh, um, you know, a London cast with a recording of a musical based on Metropolis, the film. Uh, Joe Brooks, you know Joe Brooks. Joe Brooks, sure. You like my like that's his that's his call, and so. Um, I said, well, you, you won't get it on Spotify because, oh, why is it on Spotify? I said, if you want to listen to Metropolis, you have to buy the album. You have to download it. <laughs> you know, otherwise, you won't get to listen to it. Well, again, you, like you say, you're, you've, got a, you've got a captive niche audience or a captive yeah. niche market. Yeah. And, and when you can do that, you can control it a little bit. It's not like uh, you're putting out into every market in the world. Yeah. So, so basically what it is is that now we are, we are, we are, we are building and we've been building very steadily. Uh, our, our base, uh, our direct sales to collectors all over the world. So as, as, as we are building up more and more uh, people buying from us directly from our website uh, and through Amazon, which I'm trying to discourage people from buying Amazon, come to us instead. So we, we are building up, we, we have quite a, quite a lot of uh, collectors from all over the world who just buy from us directly. 
Well, you were your record, were your CDs and so on sold in record stores when there were record stores? There are hardly any left. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We will, we will, we will, we will take sellers. But now you sell it on the internet, right? We sell on the internet. We, 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 we have it, of course, on, on iTunes for downloading. Okay. And we're also starting our own downloads uh, to people who want to have high quality um, uh, uh, files. So, so we are, we are developing to be able to, to have people. That and download. you make that for sale through iTunes. Yeah. I, 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 iTunes that's for sale. And, um, and so, so there is still a market out there. Uh, but of course, being an independent company, I don't need to sell hundreds of thousands of CDs to justify the existence. Right. Selling 200, I'm happy, you know. That that's a you're in a unique place. I this very rare to find someone who's able to do what you're doing. Well, because I, I tap onto a market, a, a, a niche. You see, because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't function to make money. I function to promote and to preserve the art of the musical theater. You know, and and, and because of that, it just bounces off each other. I, I, I mean, my catalog is quite unique. And quite unusual, and in fact, is 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 almost one of its kind. We have over seventy odd complete recordings. These are complete scores, and sometimes complete plays, like *Men of La Mancha*. We have the whole play, all the words and all the dialogue are in the recording. It's the only recording. We have over seventy plays, and I don't think there's any other company, major or minor, that got more than ten or twenty of of these um, complete recordings of this. I would say you're the perfect example of what they teach people in school in business, which is find a need and fill it. And you've yes. filled a need that that no one else is filling. And yes. that that's a that's a uh, perfect formula for success. So we've been talking today. I, I'm having this great conversation for way more than an hour and 15 minutes with John Yap of J Records. And so we're going to wind this thing down a little bit, um, John. And you've obviously worked with some huge uh, famous people over time, and you've been doing this for a long time, with like 40 years. Um, I'm just wondering if you can share with us an oddball, weird, strange, quirky, or maybe just plain funny story from your, your history. Well, I've got an interesting story, but uh, I got loads of stories, of course. But one, I think that, uh, that, that I've actually looking back is quite funny, but it's not really at the time. It was quite horrifying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was when we were recording the, um, uh, when we recorded the cast album of Camelot All right. with, uh, with Richard Harris. And of course, Richard Harris was known for his temperament and everything else. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and he wasn't very pleasant to the cast. To his leading lady as well and so we got everything planned and called and we we're at abbey road and the, the session was supposed to start at 10 o'clock and then i got a phone call from richard harris saying i'm not coming in today <laughs> i come in on tuesday uh, or two days later whatever and and, and over that you know so okay fine so i, I went into and then the conductor the poor conductor was quivering in this street Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know what to do. He says, uh, because if you can play the backing track down, I don't know how, he's, how he sings it because he sings it differently every night. <laughs> he sings sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's this and that. I said, okay. I said, we'll do three versions. We do a fast version, the mid version, and the slow version of all his songs. You know, we just put three down. So, okay, Richard Harris came. And uh, he had, at the time, he had, he had bodyguards with guns and everything into the studio, you know. They're not supposed to come with guns, but everyone made, a, made a, an ex exception for them. And, um, and so he started recording and he put on his headphones. He took them off and he heard the first few bars, took them off and he threw the chair at the conductor, who was the conductor. I said, yeah, he used a, a expletive, you know, uh, it's all your you're useless and this, this is too slow for me you know it's too slow <laughs> <laughs> i said okay richard don't worry you want it faster well fine we have a faster version so i played the faster version for him and then he settled down but the whole day it was like that <laughs> but luckily we did the three versions but he was he was fine i mean he did he, he did he did everything he did and then he left you know so so that is like such a spectacular resolution or how to figure out how to solve a problem 
that you didn't know you had going into it and you no. just solved the problem. That's just really great. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm one who, when, when I'm confronted with something that is not working, rather than saying, oh God, it can't be done. I always say, no, let's work out a way to make it work. That's, all, that's my philosophy all my life. Well, I, I would say that's way. why you're so successful. Yeah. Thank you. You've always made it work. And I think that that's a, a, a great lesson. So last question for you. That was a great story. I loved it. Um, can you, uh, you've given us plenty of tips and, and advice so far, but do you have a, a great piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to those who are maybe just breaking into the business or maybe they've been in a little bit and are trying to get to the next place? Well, the only thing I can say is uh, uh, do it for yourself mm -hmm. and for your belief and, 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 and what you want to do, believe in it and what you love. Because if you do it, you think that you're going to get rich, you're, you're bound to, to fail. Unfortunately, the opportunities that were afforded to me when I first started are no longer there because, uh, because there's no music business anymore. No, you know? it's all changed. It's all changed, but you can do it at home though. Um, that, that's the only change in that in the past, you have to rely on being part of a corporation, being part of a business. Now you can actually make recordings yourself at home. You see, if you want to get, uh, and there's this, and there's this, um, this, uh, this platform out there, the internet and the YouTube and everything else, that's your platform. It's very different today where you can actually, for a very modest amount of money, by quality equipment that you can put into your home and make records from. Yes, but but the important thing is you got to do projects and things that you believe in that if that means something to you and 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 from your heart and from your soul, not because you think you think going to make the next, next hit song or the next bit of recording that's going to make you money. I think that's the single most important piece of advice I, I, I've ever heard. And I've heard others say similar things, but what you're saying is so true. If you don't believe in it and you're not passionate about it, it's going to show. That's the yeah. problem is it, it will show that you don't care about it yeah. and people will see it immediately. Yeah, absolutely. And especially if you're working with other people, because if you're not true to yourself, they'll see through it. Stars. I mean, I, one thing which, which I've noticed with me working with, with big opera stars and things like that, if they trust you, they're putty in your hand. They'll do whatever you tell them and take your advice. But if you bullshit them, they know that they're sung badly. When they when they've sung something that is not quite right, and you go into the studio and say, brilliant, it's wonderful, you know, you they, they know you're bullshitting. Excuse me for swearing, but but the mo the moment they, they the moment they, they realize that you're not being true, they don't trust you anymore. They can they, smell a lie. Yeah, they do. So mm -hmm. I've been very truthful to them, but of course I won't be brutal to them. I was, I'll put it to them in a different way, you know, if they're not doing something right. And they know it and they say, yeah, John, I know I, I, I didn't sing that well. Well, John Yap, this has been a fantastic hour and 20 minutes or so. And I, I can't thank you enough for spending a little time with me to lend us all this, these great stories and so much wonderful wisdom. I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And um, I look forward to listening to the program. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.